You are listening to Mark Lack, and this is Retail 101 Online. Welcome all to episode number four, hosted by Mark Lack from Retail 101 Online. For those that don't know who we are yet, please listen to the first episode, where I unveil my extensive experience within the dynamic world of retail across the globe, and what we are aiming to achieve with Retail 101 Online. For our loyal listeners, a massive thank you for your unwavering support as we continue to revolutionize the world of retail education with Retail 101 Online. If you are interested in hearing more about retail from retail people, also subscribe to the soon-to-be-released series called Retail Voices. These will be discussions with real people talking about their role in retail, how they got to where they are, and where they want to get to. In this episode, we are going to be talking about the journey of building an assortment part two. The subject matter was so large when I was putting it together that I actually had to break it into two episodes, and so both will be released simultaneously. Just make sure you listen to part one first, though. In the first part, we deciphered the very essence of assortments. We unveiled how customer preferences shape our offerings, and we explored the fierce competition and marketplace that molds our retail landscape. In this episode, we will examine the store formats, expose you to an assortment strategy that I have used in multiple businesses already, centered on category roles, and then how you go about choosing and approaching suppliers to curate the assortment. Of course, any discussion with a supplier involves some kind of negotiations as well. So please look out for a future episode on that very subject. For now, let's get into the main theme for this episode, which is part two of assortment building. Hopefully, by now, you have already indulged in the insights of part one of our assortment building journey. But if not, fear not. Now is the perfect time to go back one episode to ensure nothing gets missed in the step-by-step process for crafting the assortment. In our first adventure, we embarked on a quest to unravel the very fabric of what constitutes an assortment. Our key takeaway? we must work on crafting an assortment structure that gleams with crystal clarity so that it becomes a beacon, not only for our cherished customers, but also for the vigilant eyes of category managers, suppliers, and our ever-dedicated store employees. We defined the essence of an assortment by creating a modified version of the dictionaries offering, the right and best assortment that satisfies customers' needs in line with the company strategy, and, By venturing deeper into the labyrinth of customer dynamics, we dissected their profiles with precision. A little segmentation here, a dash of shopping behavior there, exploring the mystique behind their every purchase. Our compass was the four pillars of cultural, social, psychological, and individual influences. And of course, let's not forget the lost art of simply conversing with our customers. A goldmine of insights often overlooked in the frenetic pace of modern retail. Part one also took us on a riveting expedition to unmask our rivals lurking in the shadows of our store's catchment area. Armed with a knowledge of their strengths and weaknesses, we crafted our own SWOT. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats ready to outmaneuver and outshine. And let's not overlook our panoramic view of the bustling marketplace, tracing the epic journey of products from inception to the tender embrace of our awaiting customers. So now, with our memories refreshed and our spirits ignited, we can now boldly step into the halls of part two. Our first stop, banners and formats. Let's first delve into the world of banners, shall we? Picture them as the distinct flags that businesses fly high, representing their brand identity in their crowded marketplace. But here's where it gets interesting. Some businesses, like Urban Foods during my time as CEO in the UAE, raise not just one, but multiple banners, each with its own unique charm and appeal. Take, for example, Géant, Prix, and Monoprix the trifecta that adorned our retail empire. Géant was a beacon of accessibility. It welcomed shoppers from all walks of life with its diverse range of products. Fronprix carved its niche as the purveyor of premium freshness, 
specializing in organics with food for now and food to go delights. And then there was Monopri, the epitome of sophistication, offering a curated selection of upscale goods that exuded elegance and French chic. Our strategy wasn't just about branding. It was about strategically placing the right banner in the right location to cater to the diverse needs of the UAE's residents. Each banner had its own flavor, its own story to tell, and its own loyal following. So there you have it, a glimpse into the nuanced world of banners, where strategy meets storytelling and every brand has its own tale to tell. Now that the banners have been understood, what about the formats? Well, formats are actually the type of business model that best describes a retail operation. A business may choose to use its own internal classification for its different store types, but the three common ones are hypermarkets, supermarkets, and convenience. The hypermarket, sometimes also called a supercenter or superstore, or if you're in the UK, extra, originated in Europe in the early 1960s. One tends to think of America for the larger style stores, but until the 1980s, the combination of both food and non-food stores in the USA was unusual. In essence, a hypermarket is a large store that combines a traditional supermarket and a department store. The result is an expansive retail facility carrying a wide range of products all under one roof. It should be possible for a customer to satisfy all of their routine shopping requirements in one trip. Providing, of course, the hypermarket has the correct assortment, which is what we are here to help you with. And, of course, on-shelf availability. Please listen to episode two, Nudge Nudge. Traditionally, the hypermarket will have a full fresh offering, including all of the service counters of a bakery and a butchery and the delicatessen. They should also have a full FMCG offer, FMCG fast-moving consumer goods, although that's sometimes a misnomer. As explained earlier, not everything sells out at the same rate. And then a full non-food offer that may sometimes look more like a department store, depending of course on the customers you are trying to attract and the competitive set. If I was to put some characteristics of a hypermarket together for comparison purposes, as a starting point, we can look at the RFM details from part one. Traditionally, a hypermarket customer would visit every 14 to 28 days for a larger than average shop as they are buying their needs for a longer period of time. As we noted in part one, customers' habits have changed and are constantly evolving, so you'll need to watch what is happening with individual customers' RFM data points. Just a reminder, RFM, recency, frequency, and monetary. The size of the store would be above 5,000 square meters, although there are some newer hypermarkets that are more compact that start at around 2,500 to 5,000 square meters. The number of items stocked obviously depends on the final size, but could be anywhere between 40,000 to 100,000 plus. When you look at the hypermarket, your hypermarket, you then need to ask the following questions in relation to the assortment. Who are the customers? What do they need? Can we service most of these needs? And then, why will they come to you? A supermarket tends to be a larger form of the traditional grocery store. It is a self-service store. Not at all like the Arkwright store that was depicted in the late 1970s comedy series, Open All Hours, where the server would fetch things for you from behind the counter. I know, four candles. Find the clip on YouTube. It really will make you chuckle. The assortment in a supermarket tends to be more limited from a categories perspective. However, fresh and FMCG are prioritized over non-foods. This again is where we are also seeing more and more of the dumbing down of the customer experience in supermarket stores, as a lot of them are seeing the experiential departments being shut down. A big hint here to any supermarket group listening in, bring back the counters, make it your differentiation. It's why I personally will travel eight miles from my hometown Tesco store to the closest Morrison store. Well done to them for keeping Market Street alive. Customers in the supermarkets format tend to have an average basket size, likely 50 to 60% of the hypermarket, but they do shop more often in the five to 10 days range. However, as per previously mentioned, habits are changing and are still evolving. So keep an eye on those RFM numbers. From a characteristics perspective, the stores tend to be above 1,000 square meters and up to 2,500 square meters. 
otherwise it starts to become a compact hypermarket. The number of items a supermarket carries is between 10 to 40,000 lines, with food and fresh being more prominent. You then have to ask the same questions mentioned previously. Who are the customers? What do they need? Can we service most of these needs? And then, why will they come to us? Finally, the convenience store format, sometimes also called Express. This is a very interesting format, as there are multiple types. An example is the forecourt or petrol station convenience store. And there is a massive competition with many independent stores. In the UK, the corner store. In many parts of the Middle East, the Bacala. In India, the Kiriana. Primarily, these stores sell food, with some fresh items and very limited non-food. There are, of course, also specialist stores here that are single category stores such as the butcher, the baker, the fishmonger, etc. From an RFM perspective, they tend to be much smaller baskets, approximately 50% of the supermarket spend, but much more frequent from daily up to every three to five days. The location of a store plays a huge role in what the customers shop for. When we converted some of the Adnock petrol station forecourts to Jeant Express stores in the UAE, we based the assortment and store layout on the three missions that forecourt customers were most likely to want fulfilled. These three main shopping missions were food for now, consume in the store, food to go, consume in the car, and food for later, consume at home or work. Even for the food to go for consumption in the car, we focused on hand foods, something that could easily be eaten whilst on the go. Sandwiches, muffins, etc. A convenience store is likely to be less than a thousand square meters, with some really compact convenience stores being below a hundred square meters. The assortment will comprise of a well-defined FMCG offering to meet the locality needs. The fresh assortment will be based on the location as well. I mean, how much fruit and vegetables are you going to sell at a convenience store at an airport? Hmm? And then, non-food will be limited to items such as batteries and light bulbs, those emergency items that you always run out of at the most inopportune moment. This now leads us beautifully into the next segment. Now that we have defined what an assortment is, understood the customers, discerned the competitive set, and know our banners and formats, we can start on the actual assortment by strategically allocating the category role. Retailers have to make choices about which categories fulfill which roles. It's not about which are more or less important. In simplistic terms, this is the essence of category roles. It's about making choices and then following the foundational strategic elements supporting each role. It informs everything from the category strategies suppliers and retailers pursue and the tactics they choose to deliver those strategies. If you walk into a store, it should be obvious which category roles they have used for each category, especially the destination category role. They could have more space, more prominence, more off-shelf displays, sometimes deeper and more frequent promotions, and keener prices. In an online environment, the principles are broadly the same. Spot the categories which are in the prime positions on the landing page, which are the categories that have pop-ups and secondary space whilst you're doing your online shop. For some big box retailers, it could be health and beauty. For others, it could be bakery, or fresh fruit and veg, or beers, wines and spirits. For some convenience stores, it might be news and magazines, or chill drinks, or coffee and food to go. It's all about the shopper. You need to turn it around and think about it as a shopper. You decide to shop in certain stores, real or online, because of many different criteria, over and above price. Am I hearing the acronym of PACAS again? P-A-Q-A-S, price, availability, quality, assortment and service. A gentle reminder to look out for this one in a future episode, as I will explain each one individually and in much more detail. We hear shoppers picking out both categories and products as the reason they choose one store over another, or actively rejecting a store because they have a poor offering of category X or Y. How many times have you heard a focus group responding with scathing comments about how awful it is to shop in a category in your store? And that's why they now make a special trip to shop for it elsewhere, because the range is better. 
or maybe the prices are better, or they've always got on a great promotion. The list goes on and on and on. Oh, or do you not hold customer panels? If not, I suggest you go back to part one of assortment building to hear why it's so important. These are the four main category roles. Destination, preferred, sometimes also called routine, convenience, and occasional. If you were in one of my training programs about this topic, I would now be giving you some laminated cards to place the definition and each strategic element with each role. However, as we are not in a classroom, I will explain each one individually and include the five strategic elements that sit behind each role. Let's start at the beginning with destination. To define the role of a destination category role, we would say that this category holds immense significance for our key customers, serving as the cornerstone of our reputation as the ultimate destination. It's the category where we shine the brightest, where customers enthusiastically declare, if I'm shopping in this category, it's got to be at X store. X store being your store, of course, unless your store is called X store, then we are right on the money. We're not just aiming for basic market share here. We're aiming to dominate, pouring dedicated resources, commercial, operational, you name it, into making this category our playground for success. The five pillars that back it up are, first is the strategy pillar. We aim for customer frequency, a high number of transactions. It is also our defensive department where our core strength is, and of course, we want to give and get the maximum attention from ourselves and customers. Secondly, the assortment pillar. We should have the maximum assortment, the best choice in the market. There will likely be multiple subcategories, both depth and width, remember, and a very strong and obvious segmentation, both on shelf and in our merchandise structure on the systems. The third pillar is the pricing pillar. Here, we need to be a leader in terms of price, not a follower. We should also show the best value for our customers. Fourth, the promotion pillar. For the promotion pillar, we will need a high level of activity, frequent advertising across multiple channels, and even individual adjustments directly to a store or even at the customer level. The final pillar is that of placement. The category must have prominent placement, a large space, very high customer frequency, and a long contact time. Just to interject here as well, the eternal conundrum of category placement. Should categories with similar roles be cozying up together on the shelf? Well, my friends, I'll leave you with that delightful brain teaser to chew on for a bit. Mull it over, let it simmer, and when you've got a moment to spare, keep your eyes peeled for the upcoming merchandising for sales episode. Who knows, maybe we'll crack the case together and uncover the secret source of shelf harmony. Okay, so now we need to move on to the preferred, or routine as some people call it, category role. What is the definition of this role? Well, we are now diving into the world of basic goods, those everyday essentials that fly off the shelves in bulk. Price tends to reign supreme here, often touted as the ultimate competitive edge. Securing a fair slice of the market pie in this category is crucial for any savvy business aiming for success. The five pillars supporting this are, strategically, here we are aiming for transactions. Lots of transactions. Think of the scene in The Matrix when Neo asks for guns. Lots of guns. We want transactions. Lots of transactions. And, due to the fact that we have a lot of transactions, we also aim here for profit. Cash profit not necessarily percentage margin. Remember, you can't do anything with 35% margin if a customer does not buy something with a 35% margin. If customers buy something with a 20% margin, that converts to cash and money in the bank. More of this, of course, in the Finance for Non-Financial Managers episode. The assortment pillar for preferred departments goes something like this. There should be a broad assortment. It needs to be competitive in the marketplace, your catchment area, there needs to be some subcategories, and it should contain all of the important brands and articles. The third pillar of pricing for the preferred category role should be competitive, but also in accordance with local competitors. There's no need to chase the price to the bottom here. It's about being sensible and fair. The fourth pillar for promotional activity, it's an average level of activity, medium frequency, and multiple channels. The idea here is to remind customers that you do have these items and that they are competitively priced. And finally, the placement area. 
here we are looking for fairly regular placement but also in relatively high frequency areas so that customers notice them on their shopping route rather than having to go treasure hunting. For the definition of the convenience category role, we must elevate our perception of this category to one of significant importance for our customers. Whilst this role is sometimes seen as less important, it actually serves as an essential pillar in creating a comprehensive one-stop shopping environment. Typically characterized by standard pricing strategies aimed at achieving an above average margin, this is a domain where we may correctly accept a normal or even below average market share. Looking at the five strategic elements for the convenience category role, firstly, the strategy needs to be one of transactions, profit, and leading to the image or perception of a broad assortment. The assortment itself would be relatively narrow with mainly just the important brands and articles. The pricing element would be within an acceptable or defined range of tolerance. Remember, customers are mostly picking up these items because they are there, where they are, and price is not always the primary concern. Promotion-wise, there will be a low level of activity, more category-based or individual item based on a request from suppliers, or to serve a particular need as part of a bundle. The placement of these categories would be basically the available space, as long as the rules regarding category adjacencies is taken into account. The last category role is a complex one, the occasional role. From a definition perspective, it looks at seasonal items or categories that are not purchased very often. However, during the high season, certain representatives of this category can show all of the characteristics of the three previous roles. Think of Christmas trees. At the start of the season, they may be destination. During the middle of the season, they may become preferred. And then towards the end of the season, it's more of a convenience category role. The five pillars supporting this category role would look like this. Strategically, you are looking at frequency, attention, and profit, especially during the season. The assortment itself would be about the seasonal choice with some subcategories and very strong segmentation. Pricing would be seasonally competitive, close to competitors' prices, but only where a direct comparison can be made. After all, a Christmas tree is a Christmas tree, is it not? Well, no, there are many different types of Christmas trees that one can buy, so you need to have the assortment that your customer would be looking for in that location. From a promotion perspective, this would again be seasonally competitive in selected channels at the right time. It seems that the traditional seasons of Christmas, Easter's and Ramadan's now start earlier and earlier in stores, whilst the consumer tends to wait longer and longer to actually buy what they need. This is a conundrum we will investigate during the marketing episode. For placement and location for this category role, it would need a good placement in the store, needs to be an area where there is some frequency, but only needs an average amount of space. With the four category roles now defined, with the five strategic elements supporting them, surely now our work is done, I hear you say. Well, maybe, but no, not really. The key with all of this is that there must be a balance. I know, trust the force, Luke. Four episodes in, and this is my first Star Wars reference. The strategic key is in the power of the mix. What percentage of the store categories are destination, preferred, convenience, and occasional? Well, that's up to you. Your brand, your format, with your customers in your store location. It is important to have a mix of each of the category roles because each of them has a function as well. What are those functions I can already hear you saying? There are actually five main functions straddling the category roles. These are traffic building, which is what draws customers to the store, transaction building, the actual selling of the stuff, profit contribution, which is where we make the money, excitement creating, where we build the passion, and of course, image creating, building pride. Can you guess which function falls under which role? It's okay, I can wait. Okay, not really. Let me help you out there. The destination category role is for traffic building, transaction building, excitement creating, and image creating. The preferred category role is for transaction building, profit contribution, and image creation. 
The convenience category role is for transaction building and profit contribution. And finally, the occasional category role essentially jumps into all of the functions throughout the season and off-season too. There would usually be a quick sidebar now into merchandising concepts where we would look at the initial five concepts of building the store layout, a department layout, deciding the equipment, the presentation concept, and then the signage requirement. There would also be a quick explanation of vertical versus horizontal segmentation, as well as the basic principles for in-store application based around PS, PS, PP, presentation, signage, promotion, safety, product quality, and personnel but these will be more deeply discussed during individual episodes. There is also a very detailed section on the really thorny subject of price and how to manage the nine laws of price sensitivity on consumer psychology and the different pricing methodologies. But this is also really for an episode on its own. Now, we really need to focus on how you put all of this new information together into a category strategy document. With all of this new knowledge, or refreshed knowledge if you have already been to one of my training workshops on assortment building, what do we have to do next? Well, now we need to build up the strategy document. We will actually have a generic copy of this document on the retail101online.com website, but I will explain the document here and its key terms with an example for the household glasses category. The first thing to decide is the category role for household glasses. Here, I have decided to make it a destination category. What is the mission? To be the best source of glassware for the home dining experience. What space will I allocate? I have decided to give 20% of the household category space to household glassware. What is my space productivity in sales per square meter? Well, you would need to calculate this based on your own store. What is the space profitability target in profit per square meter? As previously stated, base this on your own store. What are the key elements I need to take into account? Well, I want a large range exposure, opportunity for own or private label, and to add in a value range in volume, for example, 12 packs, and then singles at a higher, more premium price. From the perspective of the key packaging size, I would want singles and multi-packs or sets. Pricing-wise, for my A brands, it would be better than the competition, but also best price for the quality offered. Promotional activity would be at a high level, with an objective to promote my competence in the assortment and range exposure, not necessarily just price cutting. Presentation would be an integrated style, with a significant share going to bulk and multi-pack. It must be as a glass universe, with a samples display for the higher end, and sets and multi-packs with some off-shelf presence and jewel merchandise in key store locations, for example in the grocery beverages section. For the service element within the strategy, it would be 100% self-service. However, the employees in the household department would be given additional product knowledge via the suppliers for the products in this category. And there you go. You now have a way to build up an individual category strategy. Are we there yet? Of course not. More to come. Keep listening. The assortment range requires another level of segmentation. This allows us to satisfy all the needs of each of our customer segments. It reinforces the image of the business and it allows us to be different from our competitors. In past businesses that I've been a part of, we have used six different segmentations for products within the categories as follows. A leader article. This is usually the article with the highest market share. A follower article. These are other national articles after the leader in market share. Then we have own brands or private labels. These are the articles that belong to us and have a myriad of uses. Own brand could be at the level of Tesco Finest or Tesco Blue Stripe, or even a tertiary product with a brand name that is either sold exclusively to the retailer or is sometimes exclusively owned by the retailer. More on this though in the private labels episode. 
Then we have the first price items. These are the products with the cheapest price within the range with a secure quality standard. There are also a number of regional or local products which fulfill regional or local needs. France is particularly good at having lots of regional specialities in its stores at a very local level. And finally, the purely seasonal items that are in the assortment for a limited time period during the year, or they could be in the assortment all year, but really sell in rather large quantities during a specific time period. Here, I'm thinking of Ramadan and the Vimto Boost that we all used to get during Iftars. There is another segment that I have used to great effect in the stores I have managed in the past. In fact, we tried various experiments with where this segment of products was placed in the stores and how it was placed, and a lot of learnings came from it. This is the psychological product segmentation. I called them something slightly different. KRIs, or Key Reference Items. These were the products that were clear in the minds of customers as a reference for the category. Not just in terms of price image and range completeness, but also as a waypoint for where the rest of the category was located in a store. A very well-known retailer did an experiment whereby they moved the placement of Heinz beans just one bay across and one shelf down and had a whole category decline of 16%. I will talk a lot more about this in the merchandising episode, but it's safe to say these products, their price and location in stores is critical. You can use a very simple assortment matrix to plot how many products you need in each segment or box that is based on price, pack size and quality. You will find an example of this on the Retail 101 Online website in the Documents section. At long last, the moment we've eagerly anticipated is upon us. We are delving headfirst into the intricate process of product selection. Armed with the culmination of meticulous planning, encapsulated within our carefully crafted category strategy and assortment matrix, the time has arrived to breathe life into our assortment. This pivotal phase demands a careful consideration of a myriad of factors ranging from the nuances of customer preferences to the ever-evolving landscape of local competition and the dynamic pulse of market trends. It's within this multifaceted tapestry that we'll sculpt and refine our assortment requirements to ensure they align seamlessly with our strategic objectives. Let's dissect this process further. Do beverages feature prominently within our assortment? Well, undoubtedly. And within the broad category of beverages, do carbonated drinks hold sway? Indeed. Zooming in further, our focus centers on the quintessential cola. Yet, within the realm of cola, our discerning gaze zeroes in onto the niche segment of diet cola. Next, we are turning our attention to brands, and we are drawn towards the industry giants of Pepsi and Coca-Cola, alongside the allure of our very own private label. Now, onto the more practical considerations of pack sizes a critical component in catering to the diverse consumer needs and preferences, ranging from the convenient 150ml can to the family-sized 2-litre PET bottle. Suddenly, what initially seemed like an insurmountable task now reveals itself as a manageable puzzle, each piece fitting snugly into place. Yet, let us not underestimate the journey that has brought us to this juncture. Behind this seemingly straightforward process lies a labyrinth of groundwork, carefully laid with precision and foresight. It's the culmination of tireless effort fueled by insights gleaned from exhaustive research and analysis that infuses these final decisions with profound significance. But there is no stopping yet. We must now move on to the exhilarating phase of engaging with our suppliers, a realm where the true artistry of the category manager shines brightly. Here, Amidst the ebb and flow of negotiations, the category manager's expertise takes centre stage, deftly navigating the intricate landscape of vendor relationships to secure the optimal blend of quality, value and innovation for our assortment. Three things. In this dance of collaboration and negotiation, we forge partnerships that propel us ever closer towards our goal of delivering exceptional value and choice to our discerning customers.
We have gotten this far. Well done to all. But the next question depends on where you are listening from. As alluded to earlier, this is why you need to know the marketplace and the products you are looking for. What is the source? How do you find the right supplier? There are numerous sources that will aid you in identifying potential suppliers in both your domestic and the international market. Trade fairs, like the massively popular Gulf Food Show held in Dubai every year, could be a good source. Data market research companies will also help. Professional publications like The Grocer in the UK. Those competitor visits where you assess their assortment can also give you insights into suppliers. If you see a product you like, check the supplier source on the packet or note down the barcode for later lookup on the internet. Of course, the internet also gives you a wealth of information and supplier sources. However, be aware that the goal should be to work directly with the primary source, the producer, where possible. Cutting out as many of the middlemen, distributors and wholesalers will most likely mean more profit for you or your ability to offer a keener price to customers. Some elements you have to think about when talking to suppliers are as follows. Firstly, check the characteristics of the supplier's products. For example, their innovation standard. Is the packaging in line and convenient for our store's handling needs? Is it a completely new supplier or just a new product introduction? And what is the likely gross margin? Taking into account the competitive situation, of course. Secondly, does the supplier understand the market of its product? For example, is there alignment between ours and the supplier's targets? What is the demand forecasting like? Is it seasonal or stable? What is the current buying frequency of the product? And what is the presence of private label in the same category? Or vice versa, if it is a private label product being introduced. Will these products lead to any cannibalization of other products within the category? Importantly, what would the sales impact potentially be on the current brand leader? And would the sales volume loss cause a reduction in any later income elements from that particular supplier? To note, later income is the additionally negotiated lines within the business development agreement. We will discuss this in the episode on negotiations. Thirdly, do we know the reputation of the supplier? For example, are they reliable? What is their size, turnover, number of people, for example? How good are their salespeople? And what is their quality process and after-sales service like? Is there actually an alignment between both of the logistics team's facilities, ours and theirs? Ultimately, we want suppliers that best fulfill our needs for our customers. And you can look at this from two angles, quality and economic. If we look at quality, do they respect ethics? Do they fulfill all the legal requirements? Are they reliable and is the product quality good? What is their assortment breadth and depth? How good is their production capacity? Are they currently at full capacity and might have issues meeting our needs? How good is their supply chain to service our stores? And lastly, how flexible are they to new ideas such as pack size, shipping case size, lead times, MOQs and EOQs? From the economic side, what is the buying price? How much contribution do they make to advertising and marketing? What are the later income bonus levels? Is it on value or volume? What are the payment terms? Something very important to our finance guys. And crucially, Remember we talked about availability in episode one. How is their OTIF? O-T-I-F. On time, in full. This is a measurement of whether the supplier delivers on time and everything we ordered at both a line level and quantity per line level. This now sets you up to sit down with a supplier to start the negotiations on the actual products. But one last little element is to set some preconditions before listing a new product.
before you finally sit down with the supplier, you really need to think about some of the preconditions before listing a product. Some of these have already been covered during these two episodes, but as a reminder, you need to check the product quality and make sure it meets all legal requirements. As you can imagine, for example, there were a myriad of legal requirements in the Middle East when I was there for products, ranging from the source to the ingredients. You will need to check the competition and the market selling price and ensure that any cannibalization impact is taken into account. From a negotiation perspective, you will need to negotiate the buying price, the launch activity, first year activity, and of course, not forgetting an action plan and potential exit strategy. From the supply chain perspective, you need to think about the packaging size. Is it in shelf-ready packaging to make it easier to handle in store? What is the MOQ and EOQ, as well as the delivery cycle, lead times, initial order quantities, and delivery schedule? Once the product is on the way to the stores, you will also need to communicate with them to include a new product information sheet, where the product is to be placed in the store, and the marketing plan for the first three months or so. Finally, of course, once all of this is planned out, you then need to start following up to ensure your plan is implemented perfectly. Ah, exhausting, eh? What an amazing job our category management heroes perform. And that's a wrap for these two jam-packed episodes. We've embarked on an epic journey of assortment building, breaking it down into two episodes of three elements for maximum impact and enjoyment. In the first leg of our adventure, we delve deep into the very soul of assortments, unraveling how customer preferences weave the fabric of our offerings. We've also braved the wild waves of competition and explored the ever-shifting marketplace that shapes our retail universe. And then there was more. In this episode, we dived into the vibrant world of store formats. We unveiled an assortment strategy that danced to the beat of category roles. And guess what? We spilled the beans on how to navigate the labyrinth of supplier selection to craft the perfect assortment that will have customers flocking to your stores. Now, let me share a little secret sauce. I've put this approach to test in numerous retailers across the globe. And let me tell you, it's been a smash hit. If you want to dive deeper into the retail rabbit hole with me, I'm just a workshop away. Picture this, two days of interactive fun off-site where we'll cook up an action plan to implement these strategies like seasoned pros. So, what are you waiting for? Reach out via the retail101online.com website and let's make some retail magic happen together. Huge thanks for tuning in, folks. Got a burning question or comments? You know where to find me. LinkedIn, X, or drop a message on our website. And of course, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and ring that bell wherever you get your podcast fix so you never miss out on the excitement of our next episode drop. Cheers to the retail revolution with Retail 101 Online. And that's it, folks. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll see you in the next episode, maybe in a couple of weeks' time. Cheers.